Chris, it's great to see you here. Great to see you and your seller, me and Absolutely. my seller. Um, we were able to chat a little bit about what this is all about. Um, I see that people are coming in in reckless abandon. Uh, <laughs> we're only in about 15 seconds and we have over 70 people up and on. Um, this is working, I guess they're in the waiting room or someplace out there. Uh, what wine did you decide to open up? Well, I've, I've got, of course, your, your great um, 2018 Cabernet, the, the signature, of course. I, how could I live without this? Um, but actually, when I do, I'm going to do a little uh, thing on the Durant, and I'm going to open a 14 Chardonnay from you with the Durant. So I thought that would be kind of fun just to throw in there, because I'm going to drink this wine. You bet, yeah. I think that's terrific. Cellar. So I see a lot of friends are coming up. We have... Uh, Bud and Grace from Alamo, it's great to have you here. Carol Anderson, dear heart, sweetheart from Dallas, Texas, great supporter, great friend of ours. Her father-in-law owned a piece of property that now we have, which is absolutely terrific. And uh, her brother-in-law is a dear, dear friend of mine. It's good to have family up here. And my father-in-law, Jim, good to see you here. Jim, we're gonna be opening up one of those bottles uh, that we'll be talking about that you have in your cellar. Jim Blumling, uh, what a great guy. Uh, <laughs> Good to see you here. John Cluett, um, I was really decimated to hear about the challenges that you had uh, down at Big Sur based upon the, the fire. Oh, and uh, I hope everything else is okay there, but I know you lost your trailer and you lost uh, some stuff on the Marble Peak, which is where you live. Uh, Susan and Eric, oh gosh, you haven't missed one at all. Blaze, good to see you again. And Stephanie, I think you're about you're in about 100%. I'm not sure you've missed any at all. Michael Pierce once again. Uh, Michael Reiser and Ken Shirley, I don't think has missed any of these. Um, and Matt Wilson, Robert, good to see you too. Uh, Ken and Don, uh, and Donna, Kenneth and Donna, it's great to see you guys from Texas. Uh, this is a full house. Uh, we have over 130 in right now. We are doing great. Uh, yes. So just quickly for any of those people who don't know, because there's a lot of new names that I saw can't come up today of people who registered. I'm Cyril Chapelet from Chapelet Vineyard, and I am in my wine cellar. I have two of the most wonderful sidekicks next to me right here who are actually making it all happen. Uh, we have uh, Leslie and Erica, um, which is, you know what, this is very funny because I was worried that I might do that. It's Lindsay, and Lindsay yeah, has been with me there. for years, but we have a new person named Leslie who's working with us. And Leslie, for you out there, you're both terrific and both important to me. And uh, I'm, I'm now going to get this screwed up every single time. So I apologize to everybody. Uh, I just know it will happen. Uh, and, and my partner in crime is Chris Sawyer. And Chris has been a friend for years. Uh, yep. We decided we were going to do something a little different. Uh, we will talk about a bunch of wines. We have a bunch of wines to get involved with. But uh, Chris is a sommelier. He's uh, been a wine educator. He's a journalist. Uh, he's kind of a consultant at all levels, and we've used him as a friend, but also as a coach on different yeah. things. Uh, he's written in all kinds of things, such as Hollywood Reporter, National Geographic, uh, he, CNN, Esquire, uh, endless amounts of things that, that Chris has done. Um, he's, a, he's a chef. There's, he's, he's a multifaceted man who's done an awful lot. And today, we are specifically going to spend some time talking to you about how do you build a seller and what are some of the keys and the tools that we use or we know other people use to help you to build a seller and we are also going to bring up some toys and tricks and things that yeah. we have i am going to uh, show everybody what a core van is and how this works because this is a great way of checking into your dad's cellar and stealing a little sip of something really marvelous without them ever knowing uh, in the old days you used to steal a little bit of their bourbon and put some more water in it this way you can take it, take out some wine. Uh, but also it's a great tool that we can talk about checking on your own cellar. And so uh, Chris has a few cool tools that we're gonna use yeah, too. I've got, I've got a Durant, I'm packing a Durant. So wait till I tell you guys about this. This is a tool that you have to have, especially for the older bottles. It's gonna be fun. So once again, there are a few critical ground rules to begin with. If you have questions, please ask them, put them in the chat category. Uh, we will try to answer as many of those questions as we possibly can. The last two, Chris, have become overwhelming to the point that we couldn't even answer all of them. Mm -hmm. so, um, so based upon that, we will try to answer as many as we can. And the 
other thing is that Chris and I encourage very heavily, and I need to use my Durant to make this happen, but uh, we all have to have some wine in our glass, and uh, it has been my recommendation to all of you that you get some wine uh, in your glass right away. And I hope that everybody can see this happening, but I am now putting some wine in my glass right here. And I have used the, everybody can see that? Wow, you got three hands, that's amazing. Isn't that amazing? <laughs> I am just unbelievable. So what happens with this is that I think it's supposed to stop there. That's good. Yeah, so it did do what right. it's supposed to do. And what happens here is as I push that button, it puts, it, puts uh, argon into the bottle and that pushes out a little bit of wine. And so therefore the wine that we have in the glass here got pushed out, but I can now lift this off the top of the bottle here, take that away. And this bottle is still sealed with argon. So this bottle is just beautiful as you can see. There's no drips, no nothing. This is the way it should work. Um, you have to be careful. Do not do this with a synthetic cork. Mm -hmm. um, there is a YouTube video that uh, you can see. There's tiny, tiny little hole on one side there, and that's all it, all it took. And uh, But synthetic corks do not work with this. So uh, only yeah. use this and with- screw bottle. caps, don't, don't do it with screw caps, you guys, please. You know. <laughs> Chris, now we can toast each other. Here, cheers, ding, ching. Um, I, I, I might as well just, since you showed that great um, equipment, which is the Coravin. So I, I'm going to have some really nice um, uh, Alaskan halibut tonight, and I'm going to break open an older bottle of the Chapelet Chardonnay, which is a uh, Napa Valley, and it's a uh, 2014. It should be tasting really good about right now, and it should go great with that. Now. If I'm concerned about a cork being an older cork, I use uh, what we call a Durant. And a Durant is comes in a little package like this. This is the most expensive uh, opener you'll ever buy. This is about $175, but it's worth every penny, especially if you collect wines like I do. And the most important thing is you've got two parts here. You've got an also. So if you guys know what an also is, this is the part, like if you don't have a screw, um, you know, a corkscrew like this, you have an osso, and that what it does is goes goes on the outside of the cork, and your regular corkscrew just goes down inside of it. But this is the two parts together. So what you do is you take the cork, and you really go down with just a regular technique you would use on a with a corkscrew. You go down like this, just real easy peasy, no problems. But the most important thing is this one little part here, this little. Um, part that dips down and that's where you put the osso inside of it. So you put the osso on the sides of the cork and I'll show you in just a second once I get it in here. And an osso is really something that I've learned to use very, very well, especially with older wines. I mean, these things are, are super critical. When you break a cork inside of a old bottle, it's not, it's not easy to clean up and it doesn't look good and it's not right. So Basically, that's what it looks like looking back down at it. So this being the osso right here, and this being the regular one, and all you do is twist it from here. And so you just kind of start moving it, um, and you just pull it up, and it puts pressure on the outside of the cork to do that. And I found like if you use a bigger kind of um, bottle, so see how it's just kind of coming right out, but it's got both parts there. So this is another good tool that um, when we were talking about which tools will we use, I thought that would be a good one to show you guys what a Durant is. So that's a Durant. Cheerios on that one. And I will drink this tonight, I bet you. Yeah. So that is one of the greatest tools. Um, so we are in my cellar and, and we also use this as a dining place. And we had a dinner here uh, last week with a friend of ours who is 76 years old, and we decided to have a bottle of 1976 from uh, Chapelet. Um, yeah. And that same tool, Chris, that you used was really helpful with that. And the fellow who came to have dinner with us brought a bottle of 1953 Lafitte. And yeah, in doing that, both of these really needed to use uh, the Durand to take those corks out. Now, the fascinating thing about that, and this really speaks to what we're talking about, 
when we sold that bottle of 76 Cabernet, we sold that for about $15 a bottle. Ooh. That bottle and the website, uh, if you looked on, on the internet to find that, $200 to $400 a bottle now. The bottle of Lafitte is three or $4,000 a bottle now. He, he picked up that bottle for $25. It still had the sticker on it. Um, so just understand that's part of what we're talking about here mm -hmm. is how do you find things that are reasonable to put in your yeah. cellar that gives you the long-term ability to, uh, to have some wines. I Absolutely. see a number of questions that are coming in very quickly. Um, we do have a lot of material to go over and we're gonna try yep. to get through an awful lot uh, today about, about many of these things. So many of the questions that I see people asking will get answered, but we wanna make sure that we do answer them uh, correctly. Um, the, the first question on the Corvin that somebody asked is, how long will a bottle last if you use the Corvin on it? Corvin tells you three or four months with yeah. no problem. Um, I know people have kept their wines longer um, and it really has to do with your cellar conditions. Again, you still want to keep the bottle on its side where the cork stays wet. So you don't want to just turn it up just because you, you now if it starts to drip out of there, you probably want to drink it and go ahead because the seal, especially if you take, put the Corvin in two or three times. So um, it can last many months. Uh, I typically would probably drink it within the next month or so and just I keep those bottles aside. Um, one of the things I use the Corvin for is if I'm going out to a very important dinner and I want to try a bottle of wine that I'm not sure about, I can take a little taste. I would not put this much wine. I would just take a little tiny taste out of it to see if the bottle was sound. And that's what I use it for mostly. And, and I would just add to that, um, Corvins are great. Um, I tend to use them on younger wines because, and I'm going to do stuff with them. If I've got wines in this cellar, seriously, you guys, I'm going to share them with other people, not just myself. So that's the most important thing about my cellar is really sharing is caring, right? Um, but I think that really I don't use the Coravin as much down here because I really am going to drink these wines once they're open. Um, and that's a really important thing. So these are decisions you will make as you progress with your building your cellar. Um, I think that you're, another really important point that Searle just made is keeping the bottles on their sides. This is a very, very critical thing. And it goes back into the, it really kind of starts us off on the conversation about design and how we do it. If you look at behind Searle and you look behind me, these are bottles laying like this. We can see this caps there. And like, obviously I know what, I know what my Chapelet cap looks like. It's got the triangle and it looks so cool. And, you know, it's, it's always right there. But this is a really important thing because you really want that cork to not dry out. That's the most important thing about saving your wines. And I, I don't care if you put them under your bed or whatever, put them on their sides. That's the most important thing ever in saving wines for the long term is putting them on their sides in the bottle. So, Chris... I'm going to mention some of these things. I'm not going to answer them right here, but I want to mention them just so that we make sure that we answer them within our presentation, okay? Because yeah. there's a yeah. bunch of questions that are coming up. Um, so we are going to answer the question of whether temperature or humidity is more important and, uh, and, and how you store your wines. Uh, that's important. We'll also mention things such as um, how you would build a cellar uh, and how you do it economically. What do you do if you don't have a cellar? What are some of your other options within your home? We will try to deal with all, all those questions. And if there's any of those that we don't deal with, come back and ask us again. But I'm sure we will cover all those. We, Chris and I already talk, talked about that. We're already planning on it. So that should be pretty straightforward for you. Um, so um, so let's, let's talk a little bit, Chris, about, um, first of all, how do you get direction on what to put in your cellar and what wines will age well? And where would you go to figure that out? Well, to be really honest for me and my cellar, um, obviously it starts and it's with everyone out there that's watching us right now. It starts with what you like to drink. You know, that's, that's the first uh, focal point because in some cases you might be really getting advice on what to buy that, of some, some sort that you like to drink. And in other cases, you might be coming to Chapelet and, and visiting them and, and them advising you on some wines that are very age worthy. So really finding those things and it, it might be white wines, it might be red wines, it might be everything. And it might be bubbles too and, and bubbly, um, you know, 
high class champagne does age. So what is your whole point of what you're doing there? Is it for collecting to share with others? Is it collecting to resell? And which is sometimes the case as we talked about a little bit with Lafitte and then like how you could buy one of those wines at a reasonable price. And then it, it's one of those great vintages that blooms up and, and you're saving it to resell. But if you do resale, you really have to treat those bottles with the most respect and you have to make them look really pretty the rest of their lives. Um, I don't do resale because I wanna drink all this stuff at some point in my life. Um, but I think that the other thing is, what really is the process of what you want to do? I mean, there are certain Cabernets and we're gonna talk about some from Chapelet that I think are the most age worthy. And then you've got the, the Cabernet, the signature Cabernet, which I think really tastes good young, but can be saved for a while. And so how much do you buy of that? I mean, I buy a case of the, the signature just off the, the starter because I'm probably gonna share that with a lot of different people. Whereas maybe these six packs of the Hillside and some of these things in the Pritchard Hill designate are things that I might get a six pack on because I really wanna taste them through the years. And that gives me a lot of longevity and also different points to taste those. So I think that's kind of the starting point about what you want to do. What is the size of what you want? And do you want to mix it up a little bit? Get, do you, are you a Napa Valley fan that just loves Cabernet and that's all you're going to put in there? That's good. Um, I think that uh, Searle and I would argue that we want everything. I mean, when you say, Searle, that you want everything too, like me, um, I can't learn enough about wine, so that's why I put a lot of these, you know, Italian wines, French wines. Um, it's a big mixture down here, so I'm really trying to take care of who is coming to dinner tonight, and that's really what I'm looking at, and maybe if I'm going to pull a, a signature old, old bottle out of here, I've got it kind of customized for that person to really enjoy, and I think that's how I've planned out my, my cellar and what I drink. You know, I, I do follow the charts, you know, as far as, or even just my memory of some of these wines and how they were open, you know, like three years ago. And yeah, it's about time now and let's do it again. And I'll say just in closing on that remark, I want you guys to all think about this. You know, um, 2017 was the 50 year anniversary of Chapelet. And I'll tell you one of the greatest testaments ever to aging wine in my life that I've ever experienced is the, the retrospective tasting that we did at Chapelet. These are wines that were meant to age and we got to see it and taste it. You know, Andrea, Emma Robinson and I, and all these great sommeliers that were there with us with Cyril and the family tasting through these old bottles. It just is a great thing about why aging is so important because they're not the same wines that were, were bottled back in, you know, 1978 or whenever that vintage that we were tasting right there on the, the panel was, but it's how it's really matured as a wine. And that's why these things are so fun behind Searle and I and, and why I really encourage people to start building cellars for themselves based on what they really like to drink. So, since you just mentioned all that, and you said you mentioned how you pick up the wines, uh, Donna asked a question, and I already said hello to her earlier, but Donna asked a question is, how do you know within a wine that's in your cellar, when is really the right time to drink the wine? Mm -hmm. And, you know, I, I think that is, is one of the saddest things in the world for me, is people who keep their wines for that special occasion, special occasion, special occasion, and then they realized that they kept it for 10 or 15 years longer than they should have in the wine. So we want to make sure that people are drinking their wines within a plan and within a program. So you want to talk a little bit about how you build that plan and program, Chris? Yeah, sure. I think that, you know, when uh, Dominic and I had a, a really fun class that we did on food a, a little while ago, a few weeks ago, and I think that really some of these things are based on that food chart too. So first of all, how sweet is this wine when you first taste it? How sweet is it? How much natural acidity does it have in it? Um, is it a, does it have a lot of oak? And I mean, uh, you know, a couple of these wines are 100% new oak. So new oak needs time to really kind of settle down, open up, and it's really doing that inside this bottle um, that we're gonna be tasting a couple of these examples. But the tannins, the tannins are kind of the key too. So acid, tannins, flavor profile, oak uh, regiment are all keys to this that we really talk about. And I think that just as we talk about it with food, we talk about the same exact way with what we'd be pairing it with. It's really like 
if it's a really big tannic wine, we're going to be doing lamb that night. We're going to be doing a, you know, ribeye that's about as rare as you get you, to cut it off. But the fact is, as it progresses and the, those tannins start becoming more gentle and softer, that's where we start going, okay, maybe we're going to be tasting this very soon now. And it's kind of, I think that it's hard to guesstimate um, as we would, but I think what um, you guys have done, uh, Cyril and the family has done is really provide those kinds of the information about these wines on your website. And I think that's a really great thing. I always love reading through that because it really kind of gives a story about that vintage. The vintage is a very key, key element here. And we can go off on vintage for another complete show about vintage. But the vintage is very is something very uh, interesting. 2012, 2014, 2016 vintages, very showy wines. They, they taste real good uh, when they're young. And I would say about the same thing as we're tasting this amazing 2018. It's a good showy wine. It's, this one has so much fruit in it. And it's, it's more, it, there's so much more um, kind of blue fruit in this one. The cassis and, and that blueberry is really there. And it's, it's so floral on the nose and it's so young. And you just kind of want to drink this one. But it's not that it doesn't have tannins in acid that can put it through for seven to 10 years easy. But then you pick up, a, you know, one of these old, you know, like the hideaway on the other hand is built for longevity. And so this is something that you have to take into mind. You know, yes, the, the hideaway costs a little bit more, obviously, but there's a lot more of a barrel program and that oak is a very big deal in this wine. And it's going to take longer for it to really open up um, in the bottle. Whereas I think, I, I know that Cyril and I would argue the same exact thing. It's drinkable now, but you've got to be gentle to it and you got to give it a few hours to really open up to really, and to be really honest, I did pop this uh, a while ago too, about two hours ago, just to make sure I was tasting it really, really early and loving so, it then. But I so, think that that's kind of where I'm at, yeah, on these kinds of decisions. So Chris, um, we have a couple of polls that we'd like to pull up because let's, let's see who we're really talking to. So if people want to go through these polls, they're going to be pretty straightforward. We're going to try to do a poll that you can answer uh, them right away, and then we can get all the answers, and we can kind of see who we're speaking to. So the very first poll, part of the poll is, uh, do you have a seller? Uh, let's see what we have there. And next is, if you have a seller, do you have a refrigeration system? In your is your seller zero to 100 bottles? 100 to 250, over 500. Do you have a seller management system? Is it manual? Uh, is it a seller tracking system? Or do you have a paid professional? So go ahead and start answering those. I see people are jumping right on it. They're answering the questions. Let's get, we'll give them a minute or two. Um, we wanted to make this quick and easy instead of going back and forth with a bunch of polls, Chris. Uh, we thought yeah, we'd just sure. put them all up. This is the first time we've done so many polls at one time, but I think that sure. uh, we're, we're getting the kind of response that we wanted to. We've got over uh, almost 80% of the people okay. already uh, playing and who are on. This is great. Uh, give us just another moment or two. Um, but I think that I will throw that up for everybody else to see. And then Chris, you can maybe just, we can maybe discuss a little bit of this. We don't need to get too down in the weeds, yeah. but you'll certainly see who we're speaking to. Uh, I well, think Cyril, that how, how, many, how many bottles do you have in your cellar? I think I yes, have about... I think I have about 1,100 bottles in my cellar, but it's, it's kind of cheating for me. It's kind of cheating for me because so many of ours are Chapelet wines that I need to have, and that I kind of have to have a lot of gifts and things that I've traded or purchased around the world. I love great Burgundies. I love oh, some of the wonderful Bordeaux. Luckily, we have some good friends we can trade with and do some of that. So, um, luckily, some some of those people love some of our wines also. So, um, so. Uh, one other thing, I'll answer one other question was up here too. Um, somebody asked about having smaller, if you didn't have a wine cellar and you needed to have a wine fridge. So we just pulled up some of the names of some of the companies you can get really easy. These are all available on Amazon. These are not the most expensive units. You can get much more expensive, but these are fairly economical. And my view is if it's a small little unit wine, uh, wine cooler, uh, why spend too much money if it lasts for five, six, seven, or eight years, and yeah. you get another one if it's reasonable. So uh, Simple Easy uh, is Edge Star. They're very inexpensive. 
Uh, it kind of gets winning overall. They're selling a lot more of those than anybody else. Uh, the Calamara, which is a dual zone, good for whites and reds. They have small and medium sized, larger ones. So they maybe have a 30 bottle to a 150 bottle sell, um, cooler. And then the, um, the Antarctic Star, uh, which is small and compact, Uline makes them. And uh, New Air Wine Fridge uh, also is great. And that's actually one you can use in your outdoor kitchen. So if you have an outdoor kitchen and you want to have one out there next to your barbecue, that works well too. So if we pull this up for everybody. Okay, we're gonna share the results with everybody. Everybody can kind of see who the rest of the group is. Looks like 80% uh, of the group here already have sellers of some type. 20% uh, tw uh, don't. Uh, in the seller refrigeration, 62% of them, and this all depends where people live too, because in some areas you need to have it more than others, but 62% do have refrigeration, that's important. 22% um, of our group has uh, one, zero to 100 bottles. 42% is in that mid range, which is kind of what I was thinking, 100 to 250. And then we have 36, a pretty substantial amount over 500 bottles. So that's, Great. so we've got a pretty sophisticated group that we're talking to here. Yeah. Um, and as far as seller management systems, this is always a good tricky one. The manual, I put down as manual using a piece of paper and writing down which wines that I have on it to, to tell you what I've taken out of it and be able to visually see what I have. The seller tracking system would be something like um, seller tracker or some of those systems that are done on the internet that you can track and you can see at any place. I like those, I think they're terrific. Uh, we don't have anybody who has a paid professional. Chris, you and I need to talk to them a little bit about where that person comes in and how that person can be helpful to them also. So sure. Um, um, yeah, I, you know, I, I do this for a, a great company called uh, Chai Consulting and, and I have certain clients in San Francisco and, and, and other places that I do this for. They are great wine drinkers. Let's just put it that way. Um, my probably my biggest client is more of a wine drinker than a collector. They are going to drink everything they have. I, I will tell you that. They, they don't really want to sell these wines. They don't want to resell them. They want to enjoy them. And they want me to really come in and, and pick out wines actually that fill in holes for them that they don't, they don't have or to keep them enlightened on some new things that I might have tasted that I think they'd really like. And I, I think that we were also talking to a little bit, Cyril and I, uh, one really key thing for you guys um, for, for doing it in a different way is to really find a good retailer that you get to know on more of a one-to-one -one basis um, that can really understand what you really like to drink and where you're going. And I think that those kinds of small boutique shops can really help you a lot there. But on a professional level, um, just to say it, you know, how did I start building a cellar like this? I worked for the Getty family for eight years as their private sommelier, and I got to taste a lot of great wines, and I wanted something like theirs. <laughs> and to be really honest, I still work for John Lasseter, who's my great client, and I've been working for him for 21 years. Um, and really putting these cellars together for them is something that I do. It, it's a little bit different too than I'll, I'll just say this just because we're kind of on this subject too about doing the tracker system and things like that. This, this system back here and all around this room here, which is about, it's about a 15 by 15 by uh, 15 squared uh, room. So it goes this way, that way, that way. And a little couch over here. Um, and table and DJ center in the middle. So just so you know, I play only vinyl down in my cellar. Um, but it's it's just one of those things that you you when you start building it out, you have to really have the right places to put these things. And and going through boxes is very hard. What I've done is put these kinds of wall um, things. I built these myself. Actually, that one right there, I did um, just recently too. Uh, but the thing is, I don't really have a tracking system down here, but I know these wines by heart because they are dear to me. Um, and I look at, you know, the caps on them and I know exactly what, that this is like a launderer cap um, from Mendocino County. And this is like a, uh, here's, here's a Dominus, uh, Dominus 2010, but it says Dominus on it. So I figure out what it means. So, um, you know, you have these kinds of wines that are sitting there in, I, I do it actually, how I categorize them is just by varietal and and sub regions um, so that's how i do it but that's just my way of doing it if you but tracker systems are very very good i know you've got one Cyril. so chris yeah you 
are different. You're a wine expert. This is what you do for a living. So of course, what you're talking about is natural. For the world, wine is their hobby, their interest, their, their love, and it's social. And um, I think that these tools uh, that are available very easily, and you can put them on, you can get them on your phone. And I was reaching for my telephone, but you can put them on, uh, on, your, on your phone, right? And you can yeah. uh, very simply and very straightforwardly uh, and so somebody asked a moment ago, Cyril, how do you track what's in your cellar? I'll tell you what we do, and I'm going to show you in just a moment Great. some of the Chapelet cellars. So I'm going to show you my dad's cellar. I'll show you um, our more commercial cellar that we have, and we're going to pull those up right now, uh, and you'll be able to see uh, some of those uh, cellars. And so, uh, so just... Um, so this is the beginning of, of building my father's cellar. And this is, uh, my father wanted to have every bottle hand reachable. And so it's not really extremely practical, but it's exactly what he wanted. So that's my mother in the far, doing the, uh, uh, I guess, pink color shirt. And the other two were her incredible craftsmen who built this cellar. And as you go forward, you'll start to see some of the other pictures. This is what that cellar now looks like. So... Um, kind of give you an idea. Does that transform pretty well? Um, Beautiful. Pretty, pretty special. Every bottle was reachable. As you can see, the bottles on the left-hand side, very, very old bottles of wine that originally came from my dad's cellar back in Beverly Hills, where, where I was born originally. And then this is on the right-hand side of the cellar. These are more current, more Chapelet wines here. But you can walk up to that cellar. This is my sister, Leisha, with a bottle that she actually painted one of our Pinot Noirs. Um, and, and this was meant very clearly to be easily recognizable and, and so bottles that they could just grab. Um, here's some local yeah. wines that friends have given us, and this is in mom and dad's cellar. They also have some remarkable old Bordeaux, uh, and they have some old uh, Napa Valley wines, some like Mayacamas, uh, some mm -hmm. pretty cool stuff. These are my sister Carissa's uh, uh, bottles that are there. Uh, they can't get away without having my sister's bottles in their cellar. And, um, and then there's some bottles like this, 61 Petrus, uh, Saint Emilion Cheval Blanc, uh, 61, and the 64 Lafitte. These are all the wines that we grew up with and we were able to enjoy. So we got to be spoiled by having some remarkable wines, of which those wines are still stunning. But they've all been kept. These bottles, as you said earlier, would not be bottles to be resold. They were in an earthen cellar right. that my dad had that a lot of these bottles got very discolored, but the bottles are totally perfect and the corks are very good. They do need a Duran to open them. Go to the next one. Now I'm gonna move over to my sister Carissa's cellar and this is the entrance to her cellar. And as we move forward, uh, this is kind of what her cellar looks like. Very simple, very straightforward. This is a user cellar. This is a cellar that's available to her to get wines for dinner. Uh, on any evening and be able to uh, go in there and contemplate something and, and pull a bottle of wine out. Um, it's really a showy cellar. And then as we move to the next cellar, this is where Chapelet, where we store our most valuable bottles of wine when we have the last case or two cases in the world of a particular wine. Um, and this is one of our other cellars. And this is a probably 40 by 30 pretty good size cellar and um, and these are the racks. And then this is my cellar, um, these. And these honeycomb racks, which we designed and built ourselves. Um, we had a re remarkable craftsman who helped us do all this, um, were a logical way for me to store quite a bit of wine. And then below the countertop is uh, big shelves of more places to store wine. And then all of our big bottles are stored on the side. So nice. just trying to give an idea that anything can become a seller if you want to. And we try to label them so we can see them without having to lift every bottle off the shelf. Um, and that's um, something that we've done uh, in, in making it easy. Uh, you don't want to have to move five bottles to get to another bottle. You don't want to disturb no. these bottles once they're there. Uh, and in all the cellars that I showed you have a commercial refrigeration cooling system where the humidity is kept uh, Try to keep it around 60 to 70%. Uh, that seems to work pretty well. When you get up to 80 or 90%, we end up with a lot of molds. The other thing is that we're not really interested in, and that doesn't help much. So uh, the cool temperature 
This cellar right now, I just looked up at the temperature here, is 58 degrees. Um, that tends to stay about that temperature 24-7 yep. all the time. And the, my, the bigger cellar is about 55 degrees. And my sister's cellar is about 69, is what she told me today. Excuse me, 59, just below 60. So organizing the cellar, I do use cellar tracker for, for my cellar. Um, and uh, I also have a kind of a key code as to where wines are in my cellar so that I don't have to, when I'm in a rush and I want to go get a bottle of Cabernet Franc and it looks very similar to our uh, Pritchard Hill Cabernet, I don't have to search through a whole bunch of stuff. I know where that wine is. I also know where uh, my Bordeaux, my Burgundies, uh, and my Chardonnays and, and other white wines are also. So that's really uh, trying to be simple about it. But I could also tell you if I was in at a restaurant in any place, open that thing up, take a look at it, know exactly what wine's in my cellar. But you have, yeah. the problem with that system, though, is it's as good as you make it. If you don't track the stuff, if you don't say what goes in, if you don't say what goes out, it becomes ineffective. So, yeah, I would that's say that's my of, only that's my only reason I don't have one is I just don't have enough time to 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 track them all originally. So that's and I can't keep track of them, and that's my only downfall as far as that. And I probably would have them all on Seller Tracker too. And I I will work on that. I will say that. When I watch uh, football, NFL football, I tend to get stuff done on my computer. So who knows? Maybe I can log this stuff in. Um, but it's just so kind Chris, of a fun thing. Yeah. So Chris, we have a number of people, when they looked around my cellar and they look behind me and they see that their bottles are standing up, I got to let people know those bottles are standing up for them. We stand and stood them up so we had something to kind of show. Uh, yeah. But typically within my cellar, if you look around my cellar, the bottles that are upright around the sides are either a few champagne bottles um, and or actually empty bottles that we maybe had for an occasion. And I really just wanted to keep the bottle for some reason. Otherwise, especially if it's something we want to keep for a long time, those bottles are on their side. So yeah. just Absolutely. to answer the, the question. And I, yeah. lo I love the fact that you did model it after kind of a the, the bees like little um, almost like the honeybees of the old days, like you and I remember from uh, where um, Freemark Abbey is now. It used to be a candle shop with beeswax, and it totally reminds me of Napa Valley because of that. And it's just perfect. You just slide those in there, and it's really, it holds them in place, and that's a really important thing. Sometimes when you have bigger format bottles, that's great, but you need to make little areas for those. And I, I'm sure you have a lot of those in there too. But I think just the design of that holds those bottles together as you stack them up and they kind of uh, work well to put a 12 pack in there. That's, that's great. Like so that. Chris, I've got to be completely honest. Uh, Wendy Heilman at, at Pebble Beach, who you know yeah. well. Oh, I know uh, her uh, very, Wendy very Heilman, well. Her. Actually, so she um, is going through some big challenges right now, but she's a dear, dear, dear friend. And, uh, Wendy actually uh, found somebody who designed this structure for her first, and I asked her if I could copy it. Uh -huh. She gave me the blueprints of what she had done, and I will tell you, it's one of the most complicated systems you could possibly build because every single cut has to be absolutely completely perfect. Otherwise, when you go two over, three over, then they're kind of cattywampus and they don't work very well. So, uh, so just giving. Since you mentioned it, I, and I should have said it earlier, but it was re really Wendy Heilman. So I believe that a good idea that somebody has is probably better than you can make yourself. So why not yeah. take advantage of it? Um, yeah. So Tom, Tom Hansel is asking a question. Uh, are there older bottles of Chapelet available for sale? Uh, That's a great question. question. And yes. from time to time, we do make wines available. We are doing re-releases on our Pritchard Hill Cabernet. In the future, we'll be doing re-releases on our uh, hideaway. But we don't store a lot of signature Cabernet and some of those wines for long-term sales. And that just has to do with uh, th the market tends to suck those up very, very, very fast. And um, we, we just don't. But, we've, but we do make other wines available from time to time. And when we feel that a wine is getting to a spot where it's quite terrific, uh, then we will re-release that wine. We have a program right now to have a re-release in five years and re-release in 10 years of our Pritchard Hill Cabernets and of the 
Hideaway and some of those wines in those categories. So yes, there is a program for doing that. Absolutely. So um, happy, to, happy to answer that. Uh, one of the other things that, that I think is, is important with, with building a seller, and as you mentioned earlier, is, and I'm just gonna reiterate, if, they, if you can find somebody who understands your palate, and that may be a sommelier at a restaurant, that could be a wine store owner, it could be a clerk at a store, but if they really understand what you're looking for and you start realizing when they buy a bottle or they order wine for you or get wine for you, that that wine is really what you want, you should listen to those people and you should really support them by getting some of those wines and following up with it because that's where you get that value 10, 15, 20 years later if they did it right. And uh, so you don't have to know all this. Nobody is a complete expert in everything. Find the experts, let them help you a little bit. And especially so when you're, you're, you know, sometimes you just feel like you need to replenish your cellar and you really have a little bit of extra money saved up to do that. Those are the people that are really reliable and, and really finding them. It's kind of like, uh, you know, Cyril and I would go to Wendy Heilman. I mean, of course, and Wendy, what's happening here, you know, and, you know, what from, you know, uh, Santa Cruz mountains and central coast should we be buying right now? And she would tell us exactly what she she's in love with or burgundy whites and things like that. So, you know, finding these people are really important people to us. And, um, you know, and, and, you know, and then you go, the, the ones that you really love from the, the wine regions that you visit too. I mean, and the other thing that I really want to point out here too about the why aging wine is so great. We'll kind of get into a little bit more of this in just a moment, but you know, you want to be a storyteller too. When you, when you share these wines with others, you know, having a story about why it's important for them to taste it and um, the, the story about how you got your hands on it is it's so great to sit at a table and have conversations like that when you're eating fine food or maybe you're by the campfire in the middle of the night uh, where you just decided to um, break open a bottle um, and it just is a these stories behind these wines and that's why I love Chapelet wine so much is I love telling the Chapelet story and I love kind of explaining some of my adventures with Chapelet and you know one of my great friends uh, Cheryl Wood just wrote and said oh that's why I hired Chris to be do my cellar you know she's from Texas and, and she has a great house in in Telluride as well and and she'll be out and I'm I'm taking her to Chapelet in a few weeks and she can't wait but the thing is that there's going to be certain wines there that Cheryl's going to buy for certain reasons and I want her to really uh, introduce her to some of these great wines too that are super collectible and this is uh, obviously the hideaway vineyard that we were just talking about so we I just poured myself some too so ding, so, ding. Um, so somebody asked also if these will be replayed in the seller uh, program will be yes these are available on our YouTube channel all you have to do is go to our website you can get it through our website you can go to our YouTube channel and you can watch them as many times or send them to your friends uh, certainly not everybody can be available at this time uh, on Thursdays so if you uh, want to pick up a particular some particular information or watch this again uh, we'd, uh, we'd be happy to have you, uh, uh, have you watch it again. Um, somebody brought up the question and they are absolutely right. I cannot recommend a particular individual retailer who is my best retailer. Um, that happens to be against the law, they're tight house rules, yeah. but I can tell you there are terrific retailers out there. There are some big box stores that are really good. There are some individual, small little st stores. My recommendation to any of you is to find the person as that once again, who likes your palate, you like their, their, their recommendations and, and find the person you really like dealing with there. Sometimes you can even find them online. Um, and there are companies sure. that will send wine to you online too. So there are many choices. <clears throat> if you ask me outside of the seminar, I will probably tell you directly who those people are, but I can't say them uh, publicly because of what we call Tide House laws, which yeah. uh, don't allow me to promote one person over, over another. It happens to be old laws that came from prohibition, yeah. but they still sting us from time to time. So it's a, uh, a tough deal. The other question that somebody asked here, which is kind of interesting, have I lost a bunch of bottles from the earthquakes uh, in my cellar? 
Um, something that Chris noticed, and on Chris's cellar, he has a higher lip at the edge of his yeah. bottles to keep, keep his bottles in. Um, yeah. In my cellar here, I've got a lot of space there. The earthquake would have to be very, very substantial and really shake for a long time to, uh, to shake any of these bottles out. I have not lost a bottle here. Um, and and I've, I've been fortunate. So no, this, and, and think of the package of, of, of what this honeycomb does. It works to kind of, everything is got a lot of surface space around it. So they're not like a lot of spots for them to move around. They're pretty tightly, tightly there. So, um, so it is there. Um, so Chris, yeah. um, here's let, another let me, let me question go back. What, can, can I, can I say one thing before we get off the subject? Sure. Cause you brought up a great um, thing about the retailers just a moment ago. Um, I also want to say the same thing about sommeliers at great restaurants. If you dine at a great restaurant often, and you've become friends with those sommeliers, use them as your consultants too, just because they do have a wealth of information and they start to get to know your palate and they will tip you off on some things. Uh, you know, one of my great friends, uh, you know, Tonya Pitts down at uh, One Market here in San Francisco, she's a dear, dear darling friend and Tracy Dutton, you know, from the Culinary Institute of America who I hang out with all the time. And these are wonderful, wonderful people. And there are so many great, um, you know, sommeliers at these restaurants. Obviously, we don't have all of them open right now, and some of them have closed, and uh, it's really a sad thing. But the fact is, they are a great resource for you to use too, especially if you're a regular in that restaurant and you trust them to make those decisions for you at the table. They can actually be a really good advisor for you to think about some wineries, especially if you're going up to Napa Valley. Obviously, you're going to go visit Chapelet. That's a no-brainer. But you know what? What else is there that might be kind of fitting in, in to fill some holes in your cellar as well? So. The, uh, the question always comes up, what happens if I don't have a cellar? How do I protect my wines? I will tell you my recommendation. First of all, what I want is two things. I want the most even temperature I can get that's nice and cool. I don't want to have any sunlight. I don't want to have a lot of wind or temperature variations. So I want to find a deep, dark spot typically, and one of the places that I find is typically an unused space many times, is underneath the stairs from the mm -hmm. one floor to the next. And there usually is a little space underneath there. There's usually not much air movement. It's usually very fairly cool. It's toast close to the middle of the house in some, in some regards, or has thick walls around it. The best thing is if there's concrete. If there's a lot of concrete there, that seems to be a pretty good heat sink and keeps it nice and cool. So, um, so if you don't have a cellar, uh, my, that would be my recommendation. Uh, the little wine fridges, that can be very effective also. Uh, if you're in an apartment and there's no option, it's all on one floor, there's no stairs, there's no places to do that. I know friends of mine who um, have a concrete floor in their garage and they have literally made little concrete vaults out of little areas in their garage to be able to keep them. The challenge typically there is that the garage typically isn't kept at the same temperature as your house. It might get much hotter. So if they, that's not good. You want to uh, keep it in that hopefully below 60 degrees. Ideal is 55 degrees for the longest term. If it's 60 degrees consistently, that's not a problem. That'll be fine, especially if you're holding wines for 10, 15, 20 years. If you're trying to keep wines for 50, 60, or 70 years, you might want that to be at 55 degrees. So I've covered a bunch of different questions that were in there with that answer as far as temperature and as far as ideal. Yeah. But Chris, what other places can you recommend to places well, for somebody in the average home yeah. someplace? Obviously, I'm in my cellar right now, and this cellar was actually built in the 1920s. Uh, the house is from the uh, 1880, 1885 is when this house was built. So the cellar down here is naturally cool. Um, it, it is at 60 degrees at all times. I come down here often. I have a, like a little bench over there where I actually do a lot of stuff on my computer down here because it's cooler down here than it is in the house in this very hot streak. Um, 
the weekends that we have as of late, especially. But um, I think that really keeping things closer to the lower levels too. I remember heat rises and you put, you put stuff on top of the, in the top part of your kitchen, you're just asking for a disaster right there. It's not gonna happen. Uh, you know, kitchens are hot. There's a lot of movement in there. They're not, that's not a good place to put things up. Put them down, down closest to the floor. And I think that that's concrete actually is a really great thing to, to just use is concrete and laying that. I think with your house to really where's the biggest shadowed area of the house is there a tree there and is that room really kind of shadowed a lot more from sun than than other places in the house that's worth thinking about as well closets absolutely you can build um, shelves into closets um you know i i grew up with uh, winona Ryder, which is totally crazy but her parents kept everything underneath their bed. So obviously that's the heat rising thing. So you can you can do things, but it's, um, you know, you, you really wanna keep it in the coolest climate conditions and it's for whites and reds. But sometimes as you were saying, uh, Cyril, and I think this is a really good point about underneath stairwells and things like that, that's great. And you can really almost take the, you can almost take the um, the wall out there and actually open that up a little bit more if, you, if, it's, um, if it's cool enough. But the, the thing is, you could also have just a white wine fridge in the kitchen and do the reds in there. So kind of how you divvy out where the location of what you drink is. I mean, putting a small fridge in, inside the kitchen because you drink a lot of Sauvignon Blanc and, and of course, the great Chapelet Chenin Blanc um, and, and Chardonnay programs, too. That's something to have close to the kitchen because you drink it a lot. So maybe that's the investment in the fridge and maybe the reds need to be in the cellar. So you've got a lot of options there. So a couple of questions came up, Chris, because it's so casual for you to mention so many of your sommelier friends. But for those people who don't have Chris in their backyard, um, I can tell you that I'm going to volunteer, Chris, to help you a little bit because if you are some other place and you want to know about a sommelier. There are many sommeliers who will do as an evaluation of your cellar uh, without ever seeing it. And they will, you give them a list of the wines, they'll help you to give you an idea of which wines to drink first, which wines maybe are past their prime, and, and maybe even some wines that you might like to have based upon the wine you, are, wines you already have. And, they, um, and, and they're not typically expensive, honestly. And yeah. most of the psalms do this because of a love of doing it. Um, they usually charge a fee to do it, but it's usually not expensive. And I would say, don't be scared about to paying them a little bit of money to do it. Um, but always make sure that you're aware of what they're going to charge before you do it. So you don't have any hurt feelings. I think yeah. that's important, but we can help find you those people. So if you're interested, get hold of Chris or myself afterwards, and we would be happy to, to support that. Um, yeah. I see another question that is the question that keeps coming up and there's been several of them today uh, about uh, how is Chapelet and how are you faring with the fires? Oh, yeah. uh, just quickly, uh, and uh, the fires were scary. They're devastating as they were in 17. It was a big challenge. Uh, my brother Dominic, Dave Perio, uh, and uh, Andrew, and our fire chief, Kevin Tui, uh, were basically had an awful lot of sleepless nights here protecting Pritchard Hill and Keep it, whoa, he's going for the big guns now. Okay, I Pritchard can see Hill, that. That Pritchard was very really clear too. Pritchard Hill alert, you guys. Perfect. So, um, so our objective was to protect ourselves and our neighbors and do everything we could do to keep it in the back part of the ranch, back where the cattle ranch is, back there. And and the cows are really there 100% to eat down the grasses, so we don't have these. Uh, brutal fires that get into the canopy. We were fortunate it didn't get in the canopy, but I did do a lot of damage on the backside of the ranch. Um, fortunately for us, the winds were blowing out of the west towards the east, so we actually had mostly clear days during the fires, but um, the, the residue and the smoke that lingered for several days after the fires has been something that every winery is dealing with right now, and we have every block of vineyard has been tested, and every Block of Vineyard has a micro-fermentation happening, which is getting tested also. But right now, the real challenge is we're about 30 to 35 days out before we'll get any results back from any tests that go in. 
now or even in the last week or so. Uh, the labs are extremely overloaded because these fires were everywhere. And for anybody to say, uh, maybe San Diego or Santa Barbara didn't get anything at this point, but certainly every other area of Monterey County got hammered pretty heavily. Pretty much yeah. most, most parts of California got pretty well hammered. So we'll see what happens. The one thing that I will guarantee everybody here is that we are not going to jeopardize our name, our values, and what we do uh, to make these wines, uh, just to put something out in a bottle if there's any issue whatsoever. So our team is working diligently. We are crushing grapes. We are keeping things separate. Uh, we don't know what we're gonna get right now. And, and I'm being honest with you, if you have questions, don't hesitate to give me a call. I'm happy to talk to you about it, but it is a very challenging vintage. 2020 has been a challenging year for everybody. Absolutely. Um, I don't know how many more things we can have hit us, but um, we're up for it. Whatever they want to throw at us, we're going to get through it. So uh, yeah. it's it's kind of brutal. So that was your <clears throat> that was your your answer uh, for that. Um, and what another question came up, uh, and and you might want to mention this uh, and talk about this a little bit, Chris. The question came up. When you were using the Duran, why would you use the Duran over an Asso? Is there one that's better than the other? Um, do you want to talk about how the yeah, two yeah. play together so, and what so that works? So for those for those of you that missed it, I, I open a bottle with an Asso, or sorry, a Durant. and a Durant is a is an opener, the the regular a corkscrew right here with an Asso on it. You can do both. And in fact, uh, to be really honest, older bottles I would do with an Asso um, just by itself. This is an Asso, um, and I do not know where that name came from. It is a strange name. Uh, but the fact is, when you use a regular opener in there, you have the, the, the way to check um, a, a bottle just right off the bat is to put the uh, corkscrew in it and see if it starts to deteriorate. If it starts to deteriorate, use the Asso. But sometimes to guarantee, guarantee, you that that it's not going to crumble even though the corkscrew goes into it is to put the also on the outside so you've got the pressure from the outside as well and so you're spinning it with this using it as the as wrapping around and loosening it that's probably the most important thing is loosening the cork from the side of the bottle with the also and then pulling it out with this the other thing, and, and it was kind of funny because um, Cyril and I were talking about this before, the use of an Asso can be very, very helpful with a large format bottle. A large format, let's just get into that real quick. Why is large format a, an advantage? Uh, those, are, those can take a long time. They, they actually soften the wines a little bit uh, better uh, through time because you, you've basically got a mini, um, mini um, uh, barrel basically right there trapped inside of a bottle. You know, it can be a Jerobam or a, you know, just a Magnum, but it tends to be soften up very nicely because you've got two parts in there instead of being in a condensed, uh, you know, 750 um, milliliter bottle, you've got a little bit more space in there. And it's really about that point at the top too. But sometimes you get these big bottles that you can't open and you can't fit an Asso around it either because the Asso is made for 750. So what do you do? And my, my new one has become where you put the Asso in the outside and stick it around the cork and loosen the cork up that way. It really does help. And I mean, because you don't know if the cork's stuck to the side because you have no idea if that's really what's going to happen. So just using the Asso as a kind of a, a thing to loosen it up is, is an advantage too. So, I mean, I think Durant did a good job by putting these two things together. I use it often and it is really a good investment for, you know, something that, like I said, you really do get it stuck um, and you, you've got to just push the, push the cork down and you've got to filter it out and it's a real mess. And I'd say one more thing too, just, just to close this part out. People ask me all the time, what if I get a Magnum or a Jeroboam or a three liter or whatever, and it's corked? It's a very good question. It's a very, very good question. I had a lot of them at restaurants and everything. The fact is there is one thing you can do and it's the only thing you can do. I mean, if, if it happened with, with Chapelet, they would kindly replace it if it's replaceable. But the fact is, 
if that happens, it's an old bottle and you have no way out. The thing to do is take saran wrap. I know you think I'm crazy right here. Take saran wrap, wad it into balls, put, put it into a decanter, pour the wine in there, let it sit for about an hour, and then pour it into glasses. And you would be surprised that it is going to be less corked than before. And what it is, there's a certain bond between TCA, which is the cork part of, of, a, of, a, bad, of a wine that's gone bad just because of a bad cork or exposure. Um, and it actually does cling on to saran wrap of all things. And that is a UC Davis trick that I found out and I am a UC Davis grad. And it was taught to me by Michael, um, Michael Richmond, uh, who founded uh, Acacia Winery. So thank you, Michael. That was a great tip. And if you guys have a great bottle and it's gone bad, you'd be surprised how many people are ga gathering around. Oh, how's the bottle doing? How's it, how's it doing with the little clusters in there? And you'll, you'll be an entertainer if nothing else that night. Well, Chris, some of those little tricks are part of what we were talking about that we wanted to do. Share, share some experiences, share some little tricks and tools that we have on a daily basis. Getting back to it, the reason why we chose the wines that we did today, this was all about Cabernet, and then we, of course, threw the Cabernet Franc in, but starting with the signature Cabernet, going to the hideaway, then going on to our Pritchard Hill, which you and I are drinking right now, um, and then moving on to the Cabernet Franc, Every one of these wines, and I will uh, be very clear, every one of the wines that we are trying right now is easily ageable for 10 years. And that's speaking of the signature Cabernet, um, all the rest of the wines here. And I would say three of them, maybe even four of them, are more like 25, 30 year wines as far as aging. The challenge is how do you have enough of those wines to be able to try them farther on. I will tell you one trick that I use in my cellar for wines that I buy from other countries or from other, from other friends. I would typically buy six bottles or a case. And, um, and you really, I'm sorry, two bottles, three bottles, don't cut it. It doesn't help you because by the time you have one bottle and you think that's pretty interesting and then you try the other one two or three years later and you say, oh, that's remarkable. Now you drink the third bottle, you're done. That's it. You need to be able to have six bottles to case wine if you to age these wines. To for me, me to hear from somebody, oh, I've got a bottle of your 82. And this, I had one bottle, I've kept it for all these years. And I'm saying, I'm so sorry. That's too bad you only had one bottle. You should have three or four or five bottles of those wines. So <clears throat> long and short of it is whatever we can do to have enough wine to make this happen. One of the keys and one of the tricks that I do is I will pull a bottle out of my cellar right there if it's, and if it had a case of something, and I will write down some notes when I'm finished after dinner about that wine, stick it back where that bottle came for it, and let's say there's still 11 bottles left. It was the first bottle out of it. I will write my notes. Is this wine young? Is it exciting? Is it, you know, effervescent. What is it about this wine that I like? <clears throat> and I will put a little note. I expect this wine to be great for how many more years? And I'll put that little note. Then the next time I try the, that wine, <clears throat> I make a point of not reading those notes first. I go pull a bottle out of it. I know kind of what I did because I have my cellar tracker. I know when I got into it, I will pull the next bottle of wine. <clears throat> After dinner, I will write up the same little notes and you have to have enough coherence to be able to do that, of course but I will write a note again. And then I will look at the notes from the last year. Once I start finding out there's some great similarities, then I know that wine's probably gone as far as it's gonna go. And it's probably pretty interesting and maybe drink the rest of those four or five or six bottles that are left at that point in time, if I had a case. But buying these wines um, and holding them, and that's what we do. Um, and so every wine that we have today is available at the winery. Um, there's an allocation program on two of the wines. Uh, there is direct sales on the others, but we're happy to get you these wines and um, there'll probably be an offering going to you tomorrow anyway, uh, so that you can get them. The 2017 Pritchard Hill is terrific. One of our challenges, we didn't make very much of it, so there's a little less of it. Um, 2018 will be a little bit bigger year. We'll be able to fulfill more people's allocations in 2018, but 2017, 
just didn't make as much wine, no question about it. So uh, that is part of the world. Um, and uh, the, uh, there's a seller starter pack, uh, which will be six bottles, three bottles of signature, uh, three bo and Cabernet Franc at 375 retail is four, uh, 465. So um, you're getting a good, good deal on that. And that'll be tomorrow. You'll get, you'll get a message emailed to you. Uh, so the other thing I always like to talk about are oh, the Cab Franc. So try that. I'm, um, here's the bottle of Cab Franc right here also. Um, hopefully you can see that. Um, so one of the things that I've enjoyed in these tastings is being able to recommend food items to go with these wines. Yeah. Um, I'm going to stay, stick with what I started off when our first time of our first Cabernet programs, when we were doing our Pritchard Hill Cabernet. And that is if you're able to get a great big old tomahawk, a big piece of meat and able to char it really well out on a grill and be able to keep it really rare in the, in the inside is, which is what I, I would like to have it. You can always cook meat more. You just can't take the cooked out of the meat if you want to have it more rare. So what I would do since my wife likes to have things medium well, and I like to have mine as rare as it can be, um, I just go ahead and cut off her pieces, throw them back on for a moment or two just before it goes onto her plate because I don't want them dried out and I don't want them tough. Um, but uh, so those tomahawks or uh, if you can get a Wagyu, that's great. Uh, I also like lamb with these and I find that lamb and all the flavors and the rosemary and all the things that we typically would be cooked with work really well with these wines. These wines are big and complex enough that they can really take that, uh, that the other more rich and bigger fattier meats that work well for it. I, I know that my sister Carissa who's probably watching this right now would say, but wait a second, if I marinate my tofu just right and you grill it, it can be absolutely terrific. I will tell you another thing that we had just recently that is a little different than that, but we took some eggplants out of our garden. Exactly. And, That's what I was going to say. Eggplant. Oh. And you can Jeez. put any flavor you want. You can marinate that eggplant. You can do things with it. And we grilled it and they, it was about as good as almost the steaks. And we, yeah. um, I didn't try to, I didn't try to marinate it like I would meat, but, but it had other flavors that really worked well and had the texture. It was, it was really marvelous. So there's lots of options and it's really up to you to figure that out. So. And I, I would add in to, um, you know, a wild mushroom risotto if you're a vegetarian and, and things like that, that are really great. They're richer kinds of dishes. And I mean, I, I could totally live as a, as a, ve a vegetarian. I mean, I don't want to because, um, you know, I am a meat eater, but I love avocados. I love nuts. I love mushrooms. I love eggplant. I love all these things. And they can match these wines very, very well. And I think that's where we've gotten with our food culture. And I think that's, you know, my, my great mentor, Evan Goldstein, you know, master of master sommelier who who really has taught me so much about this and i've been able to do this for over 30 years of what i do but we are always learning about food and wine pairings you guys new food is in food you know we we are exploring things i think that this is a really good example i really wanted to kind of pound this point home we can't go to as many restaurants as we want right now um, and i think this is why our sellers are really important to us is really sharing with small groups of people and having these kinds of experiences at your picnic table out in your yard. Um, it's as important as, as going to the fancy restaurant, but it's really having the right wines in your place. And that's why, you know, when I really think about this and what, what you know, older wines I have from Chapelet in here, that's what I'm really kind of doing because I'm investing in these new wines right now because they're going to be the future for what I have down here. You know, the older wines like this, um, where is it? My Chardonnay that I pulled out, the, the 14. This is, this is a good one to be drinking right now, especially with that halibut that I'm gonna have tonight. And that's, it's a good time. It's six years old and, and why, why can't I do it? There's no one stopping me right now. Even though I can't be sharing it with a lot of other people, taking the time and using these wines for your advantage. And, and I think that that's the whole thing. And I want to say one thing too about the, the Cabernet Franc. Cabernet Franc is way in vogue right now, you guys. Cabernet Franc has never been as good as it has been 
in America as it is right now. And I think that one of the leaders in this movement has always been Chapelet. I'd, I'd also put Lang and Reed and a few others in there, you know, great Pam Starr and some of these great winemakers that really care about it. Heidi Barrett, of course, um, loves Cabernet Franc. So now all of a sudden Cabernet Franc is becoming uh, in vogue. It's always been there. It's just, you know, certain people are growing it better than they were. I feel that um, Chapelet has always been consistent with Cabernet Franc. And that's why I have a lot down in my cellar. And it's the same thing with Chenin Blanc. And these are two, when you think about culinary lands of the world, you go to France, I mean, you go to Bordeaux, I wouldn't call it culinary. You go to Champagne, it's kind of culinary. They sell, they, they, they will sell you on, on uh, creme brulee every time you go to um, Champagne region. Burgundy, much more culinary. Loire Valley, the most culinary, in my opinion. And that's really where these two grapes came from, the Chenin Blanc and Cabernet Franc. It's what, uh, you know, Joan of Arc was drinking this a thousand years ago, Cabernet Franc. So I feel like this is a very special bottling that you guys do that can really, you can not only start the conversation, but it's also how it pairs with things. And I think that, you know, your great, um, your great neighbor up there, Tim Mondavi, of course, um, is it, he always likes to use the um, uh, garik, garik, you know, because it is those wild herbs that are in the mountain. And I feel like Cabernet Franc always catches that. And I think this is the one where you use a little bit more herbs and that pork or the duck dish that you're doing. And it's going to be, you're going to look like a superstar for serving it at your house. And the wine's going to blow up as far as the flavors and everyone's a winner. It's great. So as we wrap this up a little bit, uh, I saw one extra question that came in. How important is it to have an allocation of the Pritchard Hill Cabernet and the, uh, and the hideaway? Um, absolutely. This is, I mean, truly, if this is a long term, these wines are getting harder and harder to get. Our allocations are getting tighter and tighter all the time. Uh, more and more people are getting on our wait list. So if they are wines that you'd like to have, even if it's three bottles or six bottles, go ahead and do it. This is the time to do it. Get on the wait list. Um, the wait list, it takes a little bit of time, but, but you know, it's not forever. So we'll, we'll get you there. On the Mountain Cuvée, actually, the wait list is open right now. You can, excuse me, on, on the hideaway, uh, you can actually get this right away. That, and I was just told by my team, hey, we have some of those allocations available. So if you really want to do that, that's terrific. Go ahead and get hold of us. Um, one of the things that, my team is asking me about is, um, we really want to hear from you. So if you have a particular subject or subject matter that you would like us to address and talk about, you've asked us to keep doing these. We don't want to just be talking to talk. We really want to be able to answer your questions and be able to have, uh, have salient issues that, that are real and speak to who Chapelet is and what we do and how we do it. We are going to get continued other people on. Chris, it's so great to have you here with us. And it really helps to, to have somebody who lives it every day and who sees it from a different side than, than Thank we you. do. And, and it's just really helpful. And I think that it, it adds some excitement. We're going to bring our winemaker, our assistant winemaker, our social winemakers, our vineyard manager in. Dominic, of course, has hosted many of these, as Chris and Dominic did one a few weeks ago. Uh, yeah. So we'll continue doing them but I need good content. I want to have good questions that you want to have us talk about and we're happy to do it. And there's really pretty much nothing that's off the charts for us to do. So if you want to just email me at Searle at Chapelet.com, go ahead and email me. I'll get back to you or probably better than that. Erica will probably get back to you and help out because she's the one who is pulling, pulling all these together with, uh, with our wonderful friend. Lindsay, not Leslie. So did you hear that? She wanted to make sure that I said she was really Lindsay, not Leslie. So these are our partners in crime making things happen today. And, and Lindsay is setting up my visit coming up there. She's yeah. very, very important. <laughs> just so you guys know. Yeah. No, hey, hey, I just want to say back to you, Cyril. It's such an honor. I, I've always felt like I'm part of the family. And that's really what makes me so happy to do stuff with Chapelet to drink your wines which are world-class wines i mean it is a sense of place that i always get from your wines and that's something that's very special it's what sets 
world-class wines apart from others. I feel like I'm up there on the hill every time I drink your wine. Um, and Pritchard Hill is a very important thing to me in my life and what really got me into this industry. It's important. So without further ado, thanks you guys for having me on and uh, Sawyersom.com. You guys can write me at uh, wine at Sawyersom.com. I'm a big fan of these guys. I can't wait to bring more people up there, but I'm also, you know, me and my pairings. I mean, that's what I do. I'm a sommelier. I'm a writer. I do all these things, but I can't live without great wine and food pairings. And that's why I love Chaplet so much. Cheers. Chris, thank you so very, very much. Really appreciate it. We will look forward to uh, being with you on the next one of these. Absolutely. And, uh, and have a great, great fall. Cheers. Absolutely. Cheers, everyone. Don't fall Cheers. too far.